My name is Aram, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm the writer and producer of the actual play Dungeon & Dragons podcast, God's Fall. My name is Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill Kill Every Every Monster. Monster. This week on Kill Every Monster, we are featuring the unicorn. The Monster Manual describes unicorns as creatures with a single spiraling horn of ivory whose magical touch can heal the sick and the injured. Its ears catch the words and whispers of the creatures that share its domain, and it knows the tongues of elves and sylvan folk. Unicorns allow good-hearted creatures to enter their woods to hunt or gather food, but they hold evil ever at bay. Foul-hearted creatures seldom leave a unicorn's domain alive. We are joined by Honey, whose pronouns are she, her. Honey is a GM and storyteller, host of the Tea with Honey podcast and creator of the Embrace the Initiative workshop. She is also a charity event organizer who uses gaming and internet safety education as ways to raise awareness to important causes. Welcome to the show, Honey. Thank you for having me. How are you? I am here. How are you? Here is all we ask yeah, for. that's really. about what we, what we expect. What are unicorns to you? Unicorns to me represent the almost universally accepted rejection of the idea that being, um, that a being or a person without affiliation to a specific organization or cause that can be put into a socially predefined category simply cannot be unique individual or okay with their unique individuality or lack of desire to fit into this pre-prescribed box or label and just be good. Like there's this this concept that it has to be this anomaly. They contrast really nicely against like angels, which are always like very specifically lawful, hierarchical. Commanded good versus just, we took something beautiful, we dumped it in the middle of the forest. It's great. Throughout history, a unicorn has always been like this representation of pure goodness, love, and empathy. And somehow, culturally, we have assigned this as a rarity that falls into the category of being too good for the world. That there's something innately delicate about decency and goodness, and that should anything entrench upon it, it is ruined forever. It's like a paladin of the forest. It's this empowered creature that acts as a defender of all that walk among the trees. Honey, where do you sit on the sliding scale of unicorns as species versus, you know, unicorn as empowered creature versus, you know, it, the the uh, monster manual specifically decided that good gods looked down at the forest and were like, and a unicorn there, and one over there, and one over there. Like forest rangers, like little divine forest rangers, like, oh, that's nice. Put one by the waterfall, and now let's have one over by the cliffs. Oh, and there's bunnies here. It, it almost felt a little bit apologetic to how, like, culturally the assets and attributes that make the world a better place with healing and protection and giving back are the exact things that everything tries to take away, right? The horn, the blood, the the hooves, and then, like, the life of the unicorn doesn't matter. So this iteration almost seemed like not overcompensating, but like, hey, see, we don't want to encourage anyone to go hunt a unicorn. We want you to to know that if you are shady of any type, slim or otherwise, and you step out of line, you're not leaving the forest. It's kind of like the flump, where D&D has set this creature up and given you strong indications that you're not supposed to fight it. But unlike the flump, if you do bring a fight, they've definitely given it the tools to fight back. The text as written in the monster manual is, however, any creature that takes a role, no matter how small, in slaying a unicorn is likely to become the target of divine retribution. So if like a guy looking to kill a unicorn was like, hey, 
where are these woods? And you went there over there. You are guilty of killing that unicorn. Their direct path can be tied back to you and something bad could happen. You got to be real careful. That's an entire game right there. Like we talked with RK about the angels as just like the God is good and the angel is just sort of the thing that carries out the order. Trying to trace that mystery of just random people getting smoked and finding out that like, no, 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 these are like the innkeeper that housed the hunter the night before who was like, no, dude, it's cool. You, you can't afford the room. I'll just let you stay. The dude who gave directions, the lady who actually like guided him through the other hunter who was going after a bear, saw him nearly get attacked and saved his ass. Like, and then it's turned out, turned out that the angel is just cascading down the line. Like, no, no, no. Everybody. One good person after a next is being punished for their good deeds. Yep. Because they helped a bad, quote unquote, in their eyes person. And there are, and they probably are a very bad person. If you kill a unicorn for sport, you're probably a dick. A lot of the monsters in the monster manual that are given those like wizardy bits, like the displacer beast. The flail snail. The displacer beast has a whole magical item. If you literally skin it and wear it, you've got a very powerful magical item. But a lot of them are either evil or animals, right? Like you can go out and hunt them. If you go out and kill a unicorn at all, it's not like you did an unnecessary murder for greed. You took out something that is by definition positive in the world and exists to help and heal. Yeah. This isn't just the evil of your action. This is the net deficit in good that you have created by killing specifically the unicorn, which makes it very weird to me when they're like, hey, wizards can use unicorns. Let's let's give the players a lot of reasons why you might want to kill. And it's interesting to me that they write it and they specifically say evil, right? And unlike concepts of good or bad there is universal standards of what evil is you know what i mean like if someone is actually evil which usually drives behavior that we'll say is bad or immoral or so on there's not like a moral compass that decides something is evil or not like it's there are certain things that's understood across the board because it says they can come in and hunt they can come in and you know get what they want and so on the unicorn is just going to be like hey Take what you need, you know, don't, you know, look how pretty I am as I walk past and you can tell your your grandchildren I saw a unicorn one. I, I think that's a conversation we don't have a lot in TTRPGs. The difference between the shades of gray that can exist between good or bad and then what evil is. There are plenty of priests in our reality who think my existence is evil flat out and would in their own eyes cast protection from evil against me and expect it to work so where does it come from is it their concept of evil and therefore it just creates a barrier of thought and will and we're just calling it protection from good and evil and it's just how we're perceiving things or is there a universal understanding and there's these scales that balance everything and everyone against some concrete understood law that is beyond us. And that's how we're weighed. We it is the sort of cat chasing its tail of D and D morality of like, yeah, there are good people can still be good and do something that is stop calling it evil. The action is bad, but maybe it was justifiable. Maybe it was a screw up. Maybe it was accident at its core. A demon is an evil elemental. It is just evil itself coalesced into a shape and doing mean. Yeah, it's mean fire. And on the other end, you know, you have coalesced goodness wandering around. When you frame it like that, it creates that system that, you know, you were talking about, honey, where you can have someone that isn't necessarily doing anything bad at the moment, but is at their heart like evil. But also now you have to rely on the DM to define all of that. And it just gets it gets murky. This is not to speak about anybody who has like they say, I want to run an evil campaign. I just hesitate to use that type of language because there's a lot of nuance in English words. Right. To your point, evil means one thing to one person. 
instead of saying, I would like to play the antagonist as opposed to the protagonist in a story, people are quick to say evil. But when someone actually does something heinous against somebody who is uh, innocent or uh, unable to protect themselves, um, and I'm not trying to get controversial here, but we'll immediately add, was well, because they didn't know better or they were afraid. They were, and that's why I've always had an issue with that term. Can fear drive people to do horrible things? Yes. But nine times out of 10, 9.9% 9 .9 of the time out of 10 is because someone in their heart is evil. And they're using fear as an excuse. When you think about campaigns where somebody may go after a unicorn, it's usually those groups of people where they're like, let's explore the story from a place that's absent from socially acceptable morality. But to me, it's still a very strange concept because where is the enjoyment? And if your enjoyment is there, it's kind of like, like I have questions. What would you say honey, that the role of unicorns are in Dungeons and Dragons? I have yet to see at least a publicized game of Dungeons and Dragons that really delve into the usage of a unicorn. So I think it's an untapped category. It's, it's a campaign I would love to run. But I think because, again, of the nuance of what they guard and protect, I can see as a DM that it's kind of nerve wracking. Like, how do I set this character up? How do I create this entity that people can engage with? And it not just be a whole bunch of stereotypical jokes and fratty humor. And, and now we're, we're throwing in concepts about virginity. And now we're joking around about purity and all of these things. Because I think you have to have a certain level of maturation at your table or a certain level of childlike innocence in order to introduce it, a unicorn as an engageable, relevant sort of uh, aspect to your game. I think it helps a lot if you cut out the virginity part and just make it a purity about like innocence and kind of like wide-eyed kind of decency. Like they'll definitely gravitate toward the himbos of the party. Like there'll be certain people the unicorn is going to be more comfortable with. Just cut the virginity part out all together. It's completely unnecessary. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually push back against that because we're looking, when you look at the stat line for a unicorn, like it is fundamentally absurd. If somebody came to me with a PC with this stat line, I would send them back. Like just, just chill a little bit. Because the only, the lowest stat is a plus zero and it's intelligence. So it's just as knowledgeable as a regular dude, but you got a plus three wisdom and a plus three charisma. Unicorns are all about personal knowledge. They don't, they don't have time for books. They're out there doing things. Like pages are a nightmare. But what, what I'm getting at is like, they might gravitate towards like the kinder party members, the more good people. But I think that's also the boring move to take is to take that sort of skittish horse aspect. Because these are very, very intuitive, like good at reading people, very charismatic, like forceful personalities. You could have a unicorn that is like sticking close to the rogue, like watching you. <laughs> this unicorn, if you really wanted it to be, could be a murder beast. And there is absolutely no reason to portray it as something that doesn't know it's powerful. They've just drawn little people along their flank, like for each one they've <laughs> for each one they've taken out, and they're walking with that side to the road, just staring you down. Come on, come on, take one step off the road. I dare you. Just running the horn against trees, making sparks. They're dropped in different locations to protect different areas. So to your point, Dylan, it's that you might have one that enjoys the softer and quieter ones. You might have the unicorn that is like, why aren't you speaking? Like, that's suspicious, you know? Or you might have the one that's like, I don't really want to socialize with you. I am an introvert. Can you just do what you need to do and get out of my forest? We're given, like, two contrasting points about unicorns. They're the f lowest CR, uh, lowest challenge monster in the monster manual to have lair actions. But also, they're given that little paragraph about being the blessed mount. These are at once supposed to be sort of locationally locked NPCs. They have an area that they guard. 
but also there are unicorns that are sent out there as the grand sign of divine intervention with a paladin astride a unicorn turning back de demons and devils just sending them back to the nine hells like the tank aggressive unicorn who's like no 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 we're on a mission we're going to stop them is absolutely a thing if you drop a unicorn in a field of daisies that unicorn may be like well hello i'm here to help and to make sure everyone's comfortable but you drop one on a cliff waterfall <laughs> and he's gonna be like yeah <laughs> Let's go! Just bursting in, ready, man. They take the energy of the place they're from. I will carry it even further. You talked about the Blessed Mount. You talked about the pal Paladin. Even then, they're still being a guardian. It's just they're a guardian of that individual. If the Paladin's power and the Unicorn are coming from the same place, it may not be guarding the Paladin. It is working beside the Paladin to protect whatever the Paladin is protecting. Generally speaking, a plot like this, the universe as a whole. But it's one of those things where it's like, if you drop a unicorn at the gates of hell on with a Paladin on his back, like it's not protecting the Paladin. It's protecting the gate. And then you get the Paladin that's like, locked eyes with a nightmare and they're walking in that circle around each other like oh i swear to god you take a step closer you watch your ass that's the beauty of storytelling because you can take it so many different directions you can engage it in so many different ways and that's why the easiest type of conflict you know man against man it's usually not my first go-to because there's man against nature man against himself man against gods to your point and so on so that's why I think unicorns are so underutilized because most DMs have to face the challenge of how do I make this palatable and engaging to my table so that they want to tell this story. It's part of why I'm a little baffled that there's so much focus on like the lair and the, the guardianship because... We talk about this in a couple episodes, and I always forget what order they come out in, but like the Deva, the Dryad, the good NPC monsters, like when you lock them to a location, you're specifically telling a DM not to tell a story with it. Why are you going to the unicorn's lair Just to interact with it effectively as an NPC and this entire stat block becomes moot? Unless you're sending it to the unicorn's lair and then the monsters are coming in behind you to attack and you have to fight with the... But if the unicorn is locked to the lair, you need to attack the lair. Otherwise, that story beat is, like I said, just interacting with a person. The lair is an environment, though, basically, right? Environments bump into each other all the time. The desert encroaches upon land. What if two unicorns from two opposing lands were like, you know what? Enough is enough. And now you have to be the one that breaks up the unicorn fight. No, guys. No, no, no. We could work it out. There's other ways to involve them. And there's no reason why all yeah, unicorns fair. would get along. I'm a really bad D&D &D dungeon master because I see a lot of mechanics outside of the basic stat blocks as recommendations and suggestions. But I very seldom follow it because for me... It's dynamic. The concept of a lair, the concept of being a guardian doesn't necessarily mean that that particular unicorn is locked into that location because there there is a lot of engagement that people have to do in order to protect it. And instead of waiting for danger to come into the forest, a unicorn that might know something is coming and knows that in general because of what's already been imbued in that particular uh, area – um, because cause here, if you look at regional effects, it says if they die, a lot of the effects and stuff are gone. Yeah. But it does not say, like, specifically that if a unicorn goes on a trip because they need to keep something from coming to that lair, that nothing is protected anymore. Now, they wouldn't be gone for long. It would give a reason to have an NPC that joins the party and then goes back home or somebody comes with them. But even like the Blessed Mount, if their champion goes astray or doesn't make it, it just says they depart. 
it, it doesn't say where they go. And in my, my storyteller mind, I can even see like a unicorn who's just decided to wander and help and heal where they can because I, I don't know. I, I like to give my, my characters, my story features a certain level of autonomy because just because you're tasked with something doesn't mean that that is all there is. They're still individuals. Unicorns are still thinking creatures with their own kind of desires and personalities, despite being these constructs almost, despite being divinely placed down somewhere. Unless you're doing a world where there are unicorn babies. I know, you want everything to be maximally adorable. Come on. No, I don't disagree with you. I'm not saying it. There's isn't. unicorn babies doing little unicorn things and farting glitter. I mean, come on, who doesn't want a bunch of those running around? I'm not saying it isn't cute. I'm not objecting to baby unicorns. What if it is not the unicorn's protection, like diminishing on the unicorn it's a unicorn's protection moves with it so if it's a way too long and it stays in another place for long enough that becomes the lair so it's all centered on the horn the horn the unicorn itself but also like that would make sense because of the way the game talks about the unicorn's horn specifically if a unicorn does die if the horn remained and is then planted in that area the the effect is forever it's forever that's why it's such a crime to steal the horn how would you change the unicorn? I would say honestly, in a lot of the the overall descriptions, I would use less absolutist language. They have a picture here, right? And okay, your unicorn can look like that if they want, right? But it gives a description of a unicorn that that's what unicorns look like. And to your point, a new DM or someone storytelling would be like, okay, you see a horse-like creature that looks like this, boom, I know that's a unicorn. Right, it's a white horse. It's a white horse with a blonde mane. Probably got blue eyes. <laughs> that wasn't, yeah. Horses, like, at the end of the day, even if you want to stick to, it is a beautiful horse. Beautiful horses from different regions look different. Like, even just simply a black horse, like, a horse with black fur, those are fucking beautiful and striking and throw a horn on that motherfucker. Yeah, when I think of a beautiful horse, I think of Black Beauty. That is the first horse in like these all white sands running across the desert. That's the first image. Put a horn, put a ebony horn coming out of that horse and it would be amazing. Have you seen the ones that are like the size of a building and have those long curly manes? Like imagine your party coming on like this statuesque, huge creature that is not only styling and profiling, but just also terrifying because they have this giant sword coming out of their forehead. The other beautiful thing in doing that is if you allow that sort of dynamic appearance in a unicorn, it means that you can surprise them that it's a unicorn. Do they even have to be horses? Like, again, if they are adaptable to their area, if there's a canyon you have to protect, a horse doesn't belong there, but a donkey sure does, and a donkey unicorn would be amazing what if you're in the savannah a zebra a zebra maybe even a rhino what makes the most sense for the area there could be tons of different kinds of unicorns but a zebra makes the most sense yeah yeah a zebra makes way more sense and also like uh if you're gonna do like mountainsides having a goat having the horn spiral but instead of like the twist it's the oh. little <laughs> oh that's so great it's it'd look absolutely ridiculous but it'd be funny and it'd be great for like, that. Would, that's a moment people love. So honey, you're a unicorn. Can you tell me why you were placed in this location? I was placed in this location because sometimes people make a decision to say, hey, we're going to give a gift to someone without permission from the creatures that they gifted. And sometimes those creatures need to be rescued and brought somewhere safe. 
where they can wander around freely and earn marks on a chart and just have a very nice, peaceful life that's not in cages or performing on stages for extremely wealthy people. Tell me about this this little safe place you've got built up for these uh, former gifts. It is such a wonderful place. There is open little fields with clover and fresh grass. There are vegetable patches that look like they were copy-pasted right out of a children's novel with the little humps and the little green shoots coming out of there. Plenty of carrots and cabbages and a little wooden fence around it built by something that has hands. Um, there are trees, and everything is usually green, except in fall when everything turns brilliant shades of yellow, and it's a picturesque, cottage core esque storybook, Glen Glade sort of location. There's even a little pond where occasionally, you know, there's one lily pad that floats out there and probably a frog sitting on a rock or a turtle peeking up. So we're dealing with like full hundred acre wood just shy of the sign that says rabbit. Exactly. So in your lovely little Glen, your your charges, your students are all out there hopping around have a lovely old time. Uh, every now and then the squirrels will come through, the deer will like walk by. Uh, every now and then there's a fox that will come by. Like you'll usually have to scare them off. Recently one, one of your, uh, one of your charges, uh, Alexander Jr. Once given to a, uh, a noble elf after slaying a dragon. Thing about elves, not time for pets. Alexander has recently taken him upon himself for <laughs> to sort of protect the glen, sort of pacing around the outside, warding off the little uh, foxes with his horn, because Alexander is an Almirage. For uh, those who are unfamiliar, the Almirage is effectively a little bunny corn. Alexander has been out on a patrol. All of a sudden, he comes hopping in at high speed. And by high speed, I mean slightly above walking pace. But he's doing his best. He's still got kind of goofy, uncoordinated legs. He comes over and goes, Miss, 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 there's, there's a thing. The Miss, also named Lathia, is this, this dark brown, um, medium-sized uh, unicorn with this opalescent kind of cream colored horn and a dark brown almost black mane and tail and on that that the middling between being a little bit smaller but at the same time like average sized for a horse um and is probably like recounting how many carrots have been planted based on how many little green sprouts are up and was like okay now we talked about this my precious little Alexander, you have to be specific. Oh, there's, there's a thing over there. Okay, that's on me. That's on me. I need to be more specific. <laughs> you need to be specific about what the thing is. Uh, he's got weird legs, like. And he gestures at a deer. He's got his legs, but then he's got like, like a lumberjack type body with the with the weird legs with the extra toes and and he was carrying a big stick and he had a bunch of sticks and he had two big sticks growing out of the side and all of a sudden uh on the end of alexander's horn a little like robin just alights it is clearly too big it should knock him over but you know this to be a sylvan spirit that has just manifested its shape as a bird a fawn approaches lithia Okay, well, Alexander, it's time to play the quiet game, which means you go do your important job and you gather all your little siblings and go into the okay. safe place. Okay, quietly though. 
You have to go fight. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Just immediately at full speed, the spirit does not move and again has no weight, so does not impact it. But this is a small bunny with a giant horn on its face with a robin perched on the end of that horn going at pace, trying to round up all of the other bunnies and trying to shepherd them into this little pen. Just shouting over and over again. Quiet time! It's quiet time! Everybody, come on! Oh my goodness, we're working on that. And just... Yeah, his father was a loud guy. He gets it from him. He's <laughs> just going to go. They will go ahead and head in the direction um, oh, that little Alexander came running from, hoping that this time Alexander didn't go all the way around and then come from a different direction. That's happened more times than it really should have, and you've had that conversation. Alex is still very excitable. As you walk, you see that Sylvan spirit sort of flits alongside you, this Robin. And as you're proceeding, it like directs you. It doesn't speak, it just sort of like pushes alongside, just gives you the hint to like curve a little this way. As it flies, you watch its form corrupt. The thing about these spirits, is they are highly responsive to the energies in their vicinity. So what starts off is this sweet little robin starts gaining a little bit of size, a little more beak. And eventually you're walking alongside something a little bit more hawkish. And then about the time where you start to really feel it, that beak shifts a little bit more and the color darkens until you are walking alongside this crow. Lathea, it's here. It is not good. Yeah, I think I, I picked up on that by your rapid transfer. I, I'm not sure if that look is for you, but I, I, you are definitely, like I said, crows have their... Can, how do I get rid of you again? Like... It perches on a uh, on a branch near your head, just looks down, seems to notice that its shape has changed for the first time. Just, oh, it is quite bad. Okay. Well, are you okay? Less comfortable now that I'm aware, but... As long as you're not in any pain, personally, if you would like to stick around, more witnesses are always better. This is not my forest. Not while it's here. And then it just starts to sort of fade back. Just almost like fog rolled in front of it until it just is not there. Aram. Tell me about your little gremlin creature. As this sylvan spirit fades into the fog and you're left in a very quiet wood. A little too quiet. And you just hear this tink, tink, tink of a wooden staff. And your ears are so attuned to wood. You know what wood sounds like. You can judge a tree just by passing by it. You know that wood is rotted. That is a corrupted wood. That is a wood that has been eaten through. There is a rot tinking its way along the path towards you. Seder, what once was probably about maybe four and a half feet tall, one horn going off the side, dark brown fur covering half of them. It was probably a jolly and light little creature is now pale and matted. Big black veins are coming out from the arm that clutches this gnarled wooden staff. And wood from that staff has grown out and into his hand and into his veins to where you really can't tell the difference between hand and staff any longer. And his hair has grown matted and long over his eyes and his head kind of hangs low so you can't see his face. It's just 
shrouded in darkness, but there's things moving through his fur that you can't quite make out at this distance. Well, hello there. Y you... Are you... Are you ill? I think he just keeps walking forward. In his mind, he's here because he is so hungry. And feeding doesn't help. Eating doesn't get rid of the hunger. The only thing that gets rid of the hunger is letting the staff feed, giving it blood. And the blood it wants is innocent blood. And something here is very innocent. And I believe we'll sate this staff, but it's not you. And so he's walking towards you, Tink, Tink, head down, hasn't replied yet. Okay, that is quite rude. Excuse me, excuse me. Tink gets within like 60 feet and stops and raises his head. And now you can see like all these bugs and insects, just cockroaches and worms and other creatures all swirling about inside his hair. Like the, he adjusts his collar and just a cloud of insects fly out and crawl about. And he does a very exaggerated bow and about half a dozen crawly creatures fall onto the forest floor. And he stands back up with both hands on his staff and place it down in front of him. Hello, Guardian. Oh my, this, this is, that's a lot. Um, is there something I can do to help? Oh, did, did you, there's a, are you aware, is the infant station a normal thing for you? I, I don't want to judge. You mean the gift? Well, gifts come in many shapes and sizes, and if it's something that you like, like we have, I have, I know someone that loves ladybugs, has a whole collection of ladybugs. Less unsettling, but that's just my perception, because I'm not, I'm not around the, is there a way for you to keep them close? Like, can you keep them closer to you? <laughs> <laughs> and he would, he would just kind of look down, and he would give us a little bow, and then, and they all just shrink back and crawl right back, you know, and just hide themselves underneath his layers of clothing and fur. Okay. Oh, look, that's quite handy. That that's wonderful, wonderful. Can I help you? Yes, there are creatures. I believe in your glade, rabbit-like. Little horns, just like yours. Ever so tasty. I am a fair person, not greedy at all. Perhaps just one, just the one. Okay, so you have entirely too much information for someone that has come to this glaive for the first time. Um, I can neither confirm nor deny that anything like that exists here, <laughs> um, but we do not have anything um, for sale that can be consumed. We do have some nice garden goodies. I can get you a basket of carrots, um, maybe a couple of cabbages, um, but you seem carnivorous. So, for one who claims to not have tidy bunnies, you do seem to have an awful lot of carrots and cabbage. You do know that those are two foods that quite a few animals, especially creature dealing animals, deal with. And also, there are quite a few different rabbit creatures that may or may not have horns that live in forests, just naturally. So, making the assumption that I have what you're looking for is just. Assuming Almirage could be a jackalope. Just who knows? <laughs> he would nod and like like his smile never leaves his face. It just curls wider and wider in a very uncomfortable way. And he nods, puts both hands on the stick and his knuckles kind of whiten. Then you won't mind me. Looking about. So you're not in it. He's just been now surrounded by um, 20 feet, 20 feet of darkness. Still 60 feet away. And darkness just 
creeps out from him and fills a 15-foot area around him. Oh, lovely. See, again, with the assumptive behavior. Just in case you know, this is very rude for a first engagement. Uh, Again, I cannot, you know, hold other people to the same standards in which I manage my glade. But I am not open to this type of engagement. So I'm going to ask that you take you, your shadows, and your creepy crawlies and exit uh, expeditiously uh, for your own well-being. And she's taking a couple of steps back and just uh, watching the area very closely. I'm trying to use this as a way to then slip around the unicorn. I'm trying to basically distract. This is my smoke bomb. Yeah. I would like you, honey, and also you, Zup, to make perception checks. Perception. I have a plus four, and I have rolled, ooh, a three plus four is seven. I'm very focused on what I'm doing. Aram, you're trying to sneak. I need you to roll me a stealth as well. My stealth is plus three, and 13 plus three is 16. Aram, you are successfully sneaking past the unicorn. I have made this cloud of darkness, and then I have just taken a step back directly behind a tree, gotten low, climbed around, like maybe at the edge of like a river bank, but somehow managed to just slip just beyond you. And I'm pressed up against the mud, and I can hear your hoofs and like a deep snort. And as you step away from the banks, I just, yeah. And I turn my focus towards the woods and start to slink towards those delicious bunnies. As you're traveling, the staff has been trying. It's been pushing out. But this is not your territory, and nothing has been able to form. But part of what allows you to move so quietly is these half-born blights. The pine needles littering the ground form into hands and shift branches out of your way. There are points where you're going to step down on something and just the twigs, the branches move a little bit and just cushion your foot as you step as this legion of just the forest itself corrupts in your vicinity and starts just helping. It lasts concentration or up to 10 minutes. That is going to buy you roughly 12, 15 seconds. Right, because as soon as I get 60 feet away, it winks out. Exactly. So, honey, he's got a head start on you. As he sort of gets past you, there's the bit where you're watching and waiting like nothing has happened it's just this this little satyr has invoked a cloud of darkness and now nothing has happened the cloud fades and when the cloud fades there's a there's a satyr like shape in the shadows for a moment and then just breaks apart into a pile of bugs Day was story day. <laughs> and she's just going to and start heading back uh, to the glade very, very quickly. Then we're going to decide which happens first with a simple perception check. Honey, roll to find out if you're the one who finds them first. So that's 19 plus uh, 3. Uh, 22. You start heading back to the glade. Just slow enough to keep, like, quiet, but still, like, at speed. Like, you're trying to make time. And when this creature crosses the threshold into the glade, you see hopping behind it, like, just off in the bushes, occasionally darting across the path, is Alexander the only Almirage visible in the entire glade. You can see, as you start getting close enough, he kind of, like, gets his head down, like, up on the haunches, and you can see that um, that Alexander is getting ready to charge. Oh, my baby. Look at me. And how far up ahead is Zup? How leisurely is Zup taking this? Zup is not taking it leisurely. Zup is on the hunt. There's this little perfect 
community garden, like right here. And there's this, there's this little like, you know, village and I'm pressed up against a tree, like looking right around it, but my attention's there. And if the camera looks just past me, there's this little bouncing Amirage just coming right towards me. So that's the scene you're on right now. So you, he's probably got, like I said, you've got two round, you had a 60 foot lead, the, the range of the spell. Yeah. And then the unicorn is much faster than you. Right, the unicorn so the can moment, cover that in a flash. Yeah. So I'm going to say, honey, you're within a move action, basically, of Zup at the moment. Um, she's going to attempt to be a distraction. <gasps> oh my goodness, you are moving with quite a, quite, um, the determined purpose. Uh, so we didn't get to finish, uh, at the top. Is there something I can help you with outside of you searching for something that you, um, are not going to find here? The moment you pull Zup's attention... Alexander sort of looks up and is like terrified. Uh, not not in like real fear, in like oh no, I've been caught because <laughs> he knows you can see him. Like there's a like you're doing the little like side glance to just make sure he's not, and he sees you do that. And Alexander just sort of like backs up into a bush, sort of ass first. Zup sees that he's been caught at the same time that this all mirage sees that he's been caught. Zup's attention is brought to that one all mirage and he'll just open his hand and have it glow. Like he, like, I can blast him right now. How do you want to do, like, 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 you know, looking at you like, hey, I just want one or I can take them all. Uh, how far would you say that from where we are is Alexander? Like in a in a, in a cone or in a, or a sphere or a focal area. Basically, uh, Zup's probably like thirty or so feet. Uh, Alexander's sort of across the path, maybe like 35, 40 feet away. Just she's just going to stare for a second, and then stomp one hoof, and there's like a, a shimmer, this this silvery sort of shimmer that goes around that hoof, and going to cast uh, Entangle. And Aram, you gotta make a strength save. I have a plus one. I have rolled a four, so that is a total of five. So, you are currently restrained. Restrained is your speed is zero, attack rolls against you have advantage, your attack rolls have disadvantage, and you have disadvantage on deck saves going forward. So I'm leaned against the, I'm literally leaned against a tree. So the branches just kind of wrap around me and just pin me to that tree. Alexander is like, mechanically, I'm just going to give him full cover. It's like, yes, yeah. he gets advantage on stealth rolls because he's a good aligned creature in a unicorn's clade. So he's just hidden in the bushes. But you also know what bush he's in. He's bound here. His staff is now pressed against his chest because both his arms are now pressed against him as these branches have wrapped around him. He would just smile. His eyes would roll over black and like parts of this wood would start to creak out and wrap around the vines that are holding him. Doesn't break him out right away. Instead, it's corrupting them and it starts making blights. Vines and wood and sinew from his own arms combine to wrap and form little spider-like things that seem to have are imbued with some sort of desire to feed. And they're popping off of him and scuttling along the forest. Let's say, uh, at the moment, we'll give you two of them. They're not going to move this turn, but basically through the vines, that energy seeps out. And the moment it gets into the ground, it follows those vines back to their roots and it gets into the soil. And immediately, these little shrubs that were just naturally sort of dying, there wasn't enough broom, so they sort of desiccated a little bit. They start just crunching in together, all of the branches, until it just forms an arm. And it just pushes up. Basically, imagine zombie made of wood. So that is something we don't do. 
and then she's going to pull up on her uh, hind legs and just slam forward with a multi-attack with her hooves <laughs> against. Oh, damn. <laughs> so just... All right, let's okay, go. You have enough range that you can get the, the charge in as well if you want to do the full one-two. So you have advantage on this because you've already got him in an entangle. That's a 19 plus... Plus 7 is a 26 total. That will absolutely hit me. And that's going to deal 3d8 plus 4 damage right off the bat. So that was 11 piercing damage plus an additional 2d8. So like 21 points of damage total. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (sighs) From just the horn. <laughs> so strictly speaking, you should be making a strength save against being knocked prone, but you are effectively tied to a tree, so like... Uh, and so the hoof... Okay. So 15 plus... 7. Yep, so 22. Tw- thank you. Math is great. Also going to hit. Oh, yes, okay. absolutely. Just one. Very solid hit. So that's 2d6. That's a 2d6 plus 4. Uh, it's a 1 plus 6 plus... So just 10. Okay, so a total of 31 points of damage. Right, right, got you. I am barely, like, like he looks bad. He looks like he should be unconscious, but he's not quite unconscious. What do we say when we do not ask before summoning strange things in someone else's forest? He would smile, and he's this cracked teeth, black ichor of blood just spilling from his mouth, his eye is all swollen, his cheeks half caved in, and he would just go, and as he does, his voice shifts and warps, and it sounds too loud in your ears, and all of a sudden there's this unbelievable pain, and I need you to make a saving throw. Wisdom 14. So it's only, I only got a 13 on that saving throw. Okay. I forgot something. I get advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. That's a second. All right, so that's a 13 plus 3. That's a 16. Got you. Okay, so that one does indeed make it. You still take damage. So you so you take half as much damage. So the end of your horn begins to vibrate like a tuning fork, and it begins to slide down your horn, and the pain in your forehead just increases violently, but you stop and you focus and you force it back. So it's not as bad as it would be. It doesn't crack your horn, but a mind spike hits you uh, in the forehead and you take, so it's four to eight, 17. Half of that is going to be eight points of damage as I send this mental spike into your mind. Were you to run off, I would know where you are, but I have a feeling that's not going to happen. Honey, you get a uh, legendary action if you so desire. Just going to stomp him one more time. <laughs> just, just, just like, one more it's going to be like a, <sighs> bow. <laughs> and he's got like, he's, he's now got the staff fully out in front of him. He's got both hands wrapped around it and he's got it in between you and him. Like, extended in front of him. That's where she's just stomping. This is kind of like a... Yeah. Make your attack roll. Okay, so 10 plus... There's a 14 hit. 14 does not hit me, actually. There we go. You're trying to, like, muster the power to force more blights out of the earth around you, but you can feel the energy that brings a unicorn to this place is pushing back against you. Yeah. And so instead, that energy just manifests where the wood, the bark of the tree starts just shifting over the vines, and it just starts guarding you against these slamming hooves. The staff almost widens into a, into a shield as the hooves are coming down. In the meantime, my blights are going straight for Alexander. So, one of the blights basically goes in and just tries to do a full body tackle. Uh, It rolled in total a nine versus Alexander's uh, 13 AC. I love how there's a second little epic battle happening right off to the side. Especially because like, he's 
like the size of a robin, more or less. So we're talking like a, a six inch tall little bugger with like also a six inch long horn. Just the balance shouldn't work. It should not be upright by any <laughs> right. And then there's these foot tall monsters coming at him. For him, it, the scale is terrifying. For everyone else, the entire thing is ridiculous. It's adorable. But no, the first one comes, tries to make this attack, and it doesn't land. Alexander just hops off to the side. The other one is coming in and goes to make the exact same tackle. Uh, Alexander immediately just lands on his feet and pivots and jumps forward and plows through the blight. <laughs> Alexander hits with a crit. <laughs> Little fuzzy crit. Dealing in total 10 points of piercing damage against a twig blight's total 6 HP. He goes through it. <laughs> turns around and goes, You're not supposed to be here. It's my little hall monitor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love him so much. Again, strictly, honey, you got two legendary actions in there you can take at the end of the Blight's turn and at the end of Alexander's turn. So I can just try to hit Zup again. It's Flurry of Hooves. That's what's going on right now. <laughs> so... Uh, 17 plus... It's 24 total is going to hit. That's definitely going to hit. Four, so 11. I am just hanging on. I have one more hit and I'm out cold of any kind. One eye's all bloodshot. It's just solid black because that icker, right? You can see little, almost little microscopic things, little worms crawling around in the in the blood as it's dripping off him. When you make contact with this last hit, it pulls Sup away. Like, he pulls a hand off the staff and goes to block. When you hit the forearm with your hoof, you hear the snap. And then you watch the tension under the skin as the roots just reset it. The roots running through his veins just squeeze his arm back into position. All the muscle fiber beneath the flesh has been replaced with roots. Just this, just these rotted, dark roots surrounded with this black ichor. Can I see that Alexander is doing epic battle with the blights? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like you, you were sitting there, and there's a moment where they all, like the two blights, ran past you, and you saw it. You watched that first hit. You watched him smash through, and then just pivot, sort of head down, legs sort of revving to do another pounce. He's just got that spike trained on that blight. Alexander is ready for this. Killer heart of a herbivore. Listen, nature versus nurture, okay? There we go. That was a good one that way. Remember, never turn your back to him. You're going to be at five stars before you know it. Give me one second. Let me finish dealing with Mr. <gasps> looks to Zep. <laughs> Snaps up from, like, training that horn on it. Just looks back and goes, okay, miss. What is your name, my dear fellow? Uh, Insect-ridden little c creature? <laughs> spits out a couple teeth. When he spits these teeth out, you can see where they came from, and already there is wood growing in the pl in their place. It is. Oh. Roots grow out and then wrap around each other to form a little tooth, and then kind of pulls back up to set itself. The name's. And when he says that. It's all rage now. Like, 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 like the wood is now creaking around his face and filling in the holes. His eye is now just an orb of wood, and he just rage swings at you with surprising speed because this is his warlock packed weapon. Can you make an insight check? Yeah, for I was about to ask you a question about something. Yeah, so eighteen plus three, twenty-one. When he says that. There's a disconnect in the way the line is spoken. Like, my name is Zup. The voice that is taking over is not this creature. Like, when it speaks, it is lying. But the mouth thinks it's telling the truth. So I'm gonna ask a question I may or may not know this because I was able to apparently detect that the wood was rotten. Is the wood that's rotten primarily focused on that staff? Oh, yeah. That staff. In fact, you want to give me an Arcana check? This one is intelligence. So, oh, it's just a 16. 
in terms of detecting, I'm going to say for, for something like this, I'll give you that as just like on in general. You know this is evil. That is so transparent. It is almost painful. The staff is evil. The staff is evil. The staff is in him now. Like those roots, it grows from the staff up his arm. You're not even sure he's holding it. Like it's just attached there now. At this point, there is another creature in there that isn't particularly detecting as good or evil, it's detecting as person. But running through that person is absolutely evil. With a 16 Arcana check, you recognize what this is. This is a Golthias staff. This is a staff taken from a Golthias tree, so named for a vampire. The Golthias tree grows in the spot where a vampire is staked if the stake is left in the ground to take root. This is a tree born out of the blood of a vampire and then taken as an arcane focus and then channeled through with warlock's uh, power and just woken up. Nor is it evil, but it's evil that is directly opposed to everything you stand for. Yeah. When, I, when we keep saying that this is rotten, metaphorical that wood is alive it, it is not dead and rotten it's alive and broken the muscles the quote-unquote muscles the wood underneath his arm increases i feel like sinew is still technically correct even if muscle isn't <laughs> and he swings with a surprising speed as his arm doubles in size and that staff comes around you do still have disadvantage because you're still restrained. All right, my plus six. First one is a nine plus six is 15. The second roll is a 17, which definitely hits. So that's the first attack. So we got one hit. Roll again with disadvantage. Second one is going to be a 14 plus six is 20 and a 14 plus six is 20. So that's the exact oh, same one. He swings this thing around, cracks you across the side and then just brings the point around and drives it just right into your chest. And it's surprisingly a sharp. You can watch as these swings come through, the vines holding him are snapping and then regrowing and just grasping, trying actively to hold him back. It does a total of 14 points of damage. As he strikes you, blood leeches into the staff and you can see the staff pulse as if it was flesh. And you can see that pulse go along it and then into his arm. And you can see more of his wounds heal. And he's just now fully this thing. You are not staring at a satyr anymore. You are staring at some malevolent force given shape in front of you. And just for a little bit of flavor through all these hits and so on, since the moment Lathia has begun trying to figure out what's going on, has locked eyes as much as possible with Zup as if she's seeing beyond and just quietly speaks as reassuringly as possible. Oh, there you are. It's gonna be okay. Uh, even as she's taking just the blows. Behind you, you hear a little yelp as a tackle goes through. And rolling back to its feet is this one foot tall little twig man holding up a tiny little bunny corn, having successfully grappled Alexander. And it just starts to, in this goofy, in a way that only occurs with legs that don't quite have knees properly, this pseudo run waddle, it is bringing Alexander to Zup. Alexander rolled a six to escape the grapple on his turn, and is just like actively squirming, I'm trying to make this as hard as possible. No, you put me down. This isn't how fighting is supposed to happen. Don't, I, this isn't fair. Miss, miss, he's not fighting fair. <laughs> I can use a legendary action at the end of this turn, right? 
can I please anybody's can I turn. please use a hoof attack to try to trip this little twig thing? Absolutely. Just just make the attack because like you literally deal enough damage at minimum roll to kill it. Nineteen. But you hear that? Look over your shoulder, and then it's just the standard back kick of a horse <laughs> through the thing's head. Just your hoof yeah. ends above its shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> And a little scrap of wood, like, just rolls across the glade. And Alexander, it scrap. is your turn. I was going to get him. <laughs> it, it's just, like, reflex. Lithia is like, we ask before we touch. <laughs> you know, just... Like, Alexander hits the ground because this thing stops actively holding him, and then it just falls over. When your attention swings back towards me, though, you can see that blood pouring f- that it had poured from you into the uh, staff, but you can also see the staff reaching out behind me now. Those veins are reaching out to that tree that I'm tied into. It's I'm starting to corrupt more and more around me. Going to do an attack focused on the arm area in that staff. I don't think I have enough move space to move back and do a charge. I don't think I have that ability, but... Actually, you do. You have 50 feet of movement, and you need 20 feet to make the thing. It's just that if you back up far enough, you're going to take an attack of opportunity from Zup. And if you're dropping that entangle, then he's making that just a clean swing. You know what? I'm going to just go ahead and do that, because she's not really focused on whether or not she's taking damage. She's got a plan. All right. And I will take one more swing. Let's see if I can get that in. That is going to be a 13 plus six is 19. Six points of damage. And again, you see the blood transfer from you through the pulsing staff and into me. It's looking much better, like like not not good, but better. Better than he was. The smile's back. All the teeth are back. Um, so she's going to take a few steps back. There's two ways we can do this, because if we read the spell evil and good accurately and we consider what the staff is doing and so on, technically... Oh, no, no, no. This is entirely within the scope. Right now, the way I'm running this is this... He's basically under the effect of a very, very high-level charm effect, a borderline eldritch charm effect. If a charm spell could be a viral infection, that's what's happening to him right now. And you are the perfect creature to get rid of all of that. Correct, because the way that she's saying that is when she asks, is there a way that I can help you? Do you need some help? Are you ill? And he's just went off. They went off the rector. Uh, She's pretty much, okay, you answered my question. So she's been trying to figure that out. This has all been just a diagnosis. You're just buying time to figure out how to cure me. Uh, Dispel evil and good has two different components, but how we're going to use it in this for the sake of flavor and because of a unicorn is with my attack, I am going to cast the the spell because that's how dismissal works with dispel evil and good. Yep. So does an 18 hit? Hell yeah, it does. (laughs) It just hits too, because with the extra wood, my AC is 18. So, 14 piercing damage. I'm still awake. I'm still awake. You see the horn sort of starts shimmering with that silvery energy, and it pulses upon contact. Um, there's a lot of force that goes into it, but strangely enough, without piercing. So it is, almost seems impossible, but it is like... The point of contact, there's even like a almost a metallic like sound as she hits, and there's a bright flash of light um, as she is using dispel evil. So, Aram, the way we're gonna run this save is there are two things that can happen. This is where I'm gonna ask you about Zup. It's basically how much has Zup bought in? Because you have two options. There's a DC associated with the Gulthias staff, which implies a certain level of like proficiency and ability score. We can backwards engineer that this thing has a plus four save. Or Zup is rolling the save. If the question is, would Zup give himself for the staff 
The answer is no. I think at his core, Zup is selfish. So I think what would happen is Zup would, at the if it's fatal, Zup would shrink back at the very end and allow the staff to be struck. Okay. Then you're going to make a, I believe it would be a wisdom save at plus four based on the staff stats instead of yours. Wisdom save, which is the same as mine, so perfect. Oh, yeah, fair enough. Six plus four is ten. Immediately, there's that hit, the contact. It is force. It does not pierce. It slams back. And immediately, Zup sort of breaks his wrist. The wood snaps. But the moment the wood disconnects, that silvery light just channels in and pushes the wood back immediately. It just cascades. And the wood just shatters. It's a cascade shatter, but it takes my arm too because my arm was corrupted. I lose the staff, I'm saved from it, but his whole arm goes too. It's just a cascade up your body and it just, anything corrupted by the wood, it's almost an internal explosion. And you are left fairly grievously wounded. Like the arm is there, but sort of just... Yeah, I'd imagine he would pass out from this. Yeah. And the staff just goes flying across the glen blasted off of his hand. We're going to fast forward. Honey, what does Lithia do with Zup until he wakes up? Then it's near immediate. You basically hit the ground and <gasps> come to a couple seconds later. Your arm is jacked up. Like, it, you can probably eventually use it again. It might take a little bit of magic. It will definitely take, like, a little bit of uh, physio. But, like, it's, it's there. It just, it might not heal right, depending. Your face just throbs. But you are not bleeding, and you're conscious. Let's do a little montage here. Would you let Zup heal here? I'm trying to see if there's there's a catch because got that mischievous tilt of the head, and I'm just like, yeah, fair. And there is like you know, is Zup a good person? Not necessarily. Zup is a selfish person, but they're not evil. That came from the staff. I think with time in a community where everyone's focused on helping each other, which is something that Zup really has never experienced. I think Zup could heal here in more ways than one. Let me elaborate on how Lathia has treated this healing. She healed him just enough so that his body could heal himself. Made sure that he had the, um, here's a fun fact, the leaves of uh, carrots and so on is good for immune system and so on. So made sure that he had some teas and things. So was he healed? He didn't get any infections or anything like that, right? But part of learning lessons is letting people learn the full lesson. So she is going to allow him to finish his healing and provide the um, very manual steps, having help from other little creatures that have little hands and so on to help with this process of healing. <laughs> um but he will be allowed to stay. It takes probably a couple weeks before someone, she's not sure who, added up in like these scratchy kind of letters to the wall where there's stars. Well, Zup's getting stars too now. He has half a star. But yes, Lithia is about healing. Um, we'll never ask him the story behind it. We'll never ask what happened. Um, but we'll ask one important question. And that question is, do you want to be happy? Zup would look at her and squint because happy is like, it was never really a consideration. And then as he's doing that, like Alexander has come out and Alexander's like, come on Zup, come on. You said you were gonna play. And Zup smiles. And for the first time, it's like, it's a genuine 
smile. It touches his eyes in a way his smile didn't before. And he just nods. He does want to be happy. And that's a question that she will ask regularly um, to gauge whether or not he it is safe for Zup uh, to stay there. And if they keep answering in a certain way, cool. If it deviates, um, I'm assuming that Lathia has connections in her grid, people who have the ability to write letters and would be writing a, a letter to um, a good associate of hers uh, who goes by the name of uh, Petros, but also known as Uncle Pete, um, and seems to send a shiver <laughs> through the other all mirages when she mentions Uncle Pete. In the background. There is this bright flash, there's a little bit of healing, there's focus drawn to just making sure that Zup isn't doing anything. Around the edge of the glade, one of these little blights, just a little shrub that has got up walking, grabs onto the end of the staff and just pulls. And it, at, as best as it can, carrying like a three foot long staff of gnarled wood, this one foot little being, is trying to just drag it and sprint deeper and deeper into the forest. After a little while, a bird comes by and lands on the wood. This is not a place for such an object. And the blight explodes. For more information about us, notes for each episode, and ways you can help support the show, head over to killeverymonster.com. If any of the ideas we've discussed on the show have sparked some of your own, tell us about it on Twitter at KEM Podcast. You'll find me at DJ Malenfant and Aram at Aram Vardian. For ad-free episodes, early releases, bonus episodes, print-ready maps, our new audio DMs notes, and my character sheets for each encounter, head over to patreon.com slash killeverymonster. You can also listen to ad-free episodes and bonus content by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts. Our intro theme and many of the sound effects you hear in the show were created by Battle Bards. Check them out at battlebards.com. This episode was produced by Aram Vartian and Dylan Malenfant. I also did the editing. Our guest for this episode was Honey. You can find her on Twitter at Honey and Dice. And if you are anything like me and all of that information just fell right out of your head, you'll find everything you need at killeverymonster.com. And we'll see you next time for Kill Every Monster. Monster.